Well, it's going to be a good day for me. When I was a kid, my favorite, favorite meal was called potato balls. And my wife is so gracious, she's going to bake me, well, she, you don't bake them, she was going to make me potato balls for supper tonight. So, yay, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Haven't had them in a long, long, long time. All right. So I'm the kind of guy that actually I don't, what, what's the word, I don't, question scripture a lot okay I just take God's word for what it is and believe what he says and so this week I was uh, visiting with one of my good friends I've known him for years and years and years and he sat down and he tried to convince me that there was no trinity and I'm thinking really and so we started talking and I was really disappointed in myself because I couldn't, it was like there was nothing there for me to say back to him, you know, like I said the basic things about God, you know, and who I believed he was and stuff and he brought up all of these other things and stuff and I'm thinking, where did you get this from? And so I was so, I don't know if the words ticked at myself that I couldn't say anything. I went home and I studied and I studied and so today I'm going to share with you about the Trinity. And I hope that you'll be able to pick up some things that will be able to give you some reasons when people come at you and say Jesus isn't God or whatever and all those things that you will have something to be able to say to them to clarify that God is really three in one. And so... We're going to have to go all over a few different places in the Bible today. But of course, the easiest one and the quickest one is to start at Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. I found that a lot of the things he was saying come from historical traditions about other people, okay? For instance, when we say God is three in one, people have a hard time understanding how you can have three persons and they can still be just one. And so he brought up that he says, well, history says, you know, all these different religions have usually three gods. And so we think you just took them from the fact that tradition, all of these. Romans have Zeus, Athena, and Apollo. And they seem to be making a threesome together. Egyptians had Isis, Horus, and Sub, and so he's saying, well, Christianity just took it from history. And so I came to the conclusion while I was thinking this through this week that it's your presumption or your, is that the word presumption? That you have where you assume from the very beginning as to what's true and what's not true. And I came down to the basics that said, Above everything else, I believe this, the Bible, to be true. No question in my mind. So what I receive out of the Bible is what I'm going to believe, and I'm not going to base it on historical references. I'm going to base it on Scripture and what Scripture says. Now, he said that too, but he always brought up the other arguments from history and stuff. All right, first of all, in the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. The word for God is pluralized. It's not singular. It's not just one. El is the word for God. Elohim is the plural for God. And so from the very beginning of time, it says there was more than just one identity, one person. There's only one identity, but there's three within it, and that's really hard to explain, okay? But God created, and it's in the plural form. If you go to Genesis 1.26, it reads, let us make man in our image. 
according to our likeness. So you notice it's pluralized forms that are being used there. Let us and our image. So that's the way it's describing God. Still doesn't give us a really true picture of what God is like, but it does give us the beginning points to say that God is more than just a single hour. If you go to Deuteronomy 6, 4, this is one of the really important ones that you need to understand. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. This is where God has just let Moses say the Ten Commandments. And then he comes down to this verse in verse 4 and he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Wow, that doesn't kind of fit to the pluralized form, does it? But let me tell you this. In the Hebrew language, there are two words that are used for the word one. One of the words means only one, as in the numeric number one, okay? So that there can only be one. The other word means a unified one. A unified one. And that is the word that is used here that God is saying. The Lord is a unified one. So again, even God himself is taking it back to a pluralized form of the word one. Okay? Now they always use the term one plus one plus one equals three. So how does that work? Well, as I, was, as I was searching through commentaries and stuff, the one guy said, but what's wrong with one times one times one equals one? And I thought, now that's really interesting. I like that. Because one, of all of the essence and everything that's there in God, times another one that is all the essence and everything that is God, times another one that is all and everything of the essence of God equals one. Makes sense. But they always use one plus one plus one plus one equals three. So that's really interesting. Now I want to take you to when Jesus used the exact same words in the New Testament. If you go to Mark chapter 12, verse 29, Jesus basically says the same thing. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, just give me a minute here so I can find it. Twelve twenty-nine. Okay. So you all see it there? The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Well, you know what's really interesting? In the Greek, there's also two words that mean one. Just like in the Hebrew language. And in this one, and they say mono means one numeric, right? You all know the term mono, okay? The second word is the word hen in the Greek language. And that one means the same thing as the Hebrew word, meaning a unified one. So in the New Testament, when Jesus refers to the same phrasing that was used in the Old Testament, he uses the word hen, a unified one. Now, these are a couple of things that I've learned that are new that I didn't know before. So that's really been helping me out a lot as well as I've been going through this. Let's look at some of the things in the New Testament. 
And this refers directly to Jesus, okay? <clears throat> now we know in the beginning it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Turn with me to the book of John, the very first chapter. <clears throat> first of all, John begins by saying, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word is referring to Jesus because we'll catch that a little later on as we go down in John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God and the word was God okay so he is relating right now that Jesus also is God got it and he says he was in the beginning with God all things were made through him but yet God created the universe but all things were made through Jesus and without him, nothing was made that was made. So you can't understand anything else but the fact that Jesus is God from the beginning of John. And then later down in verse 14, it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So he's saying, Jesus, who was in the beginning of time with God the Father, became flesh. Right? So he is God. And we can get that too from the book of Philippians. Remember that part, let this mind that is also in Christ be in you? That he gave up all the glories of heaven. Let me find that exactly so I don't do this wrong here. That's chapter 2 of Philippians. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name who being in the form of God made himself of no reputation taking on the form of a bondservant. So he was there from the beginning of time with God enjoying all the pleasures and glories that there were there as being God and he was willing to give it up and become the form of man. So there's no way we can deny the fact that God, Jesus is God. So how did the Jews understand Jesus? In chapter 8 of John, verse 58, Jesus talks to them and he says this. Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So why would the Jews get all upset? Matter of fact, they tried to pick up stones and throw them at him and try to do all kinds of nasty things to him, but he just kind of gets out, goes out of the temple, and they can't do anything to him. Why would they get upset by him saying, before Abraham was, I am? Because in the Old Testament, when Moses was called by God at the burning bush, Moses says, Who shall I say sent me? And he said, I am. God said, I am. And so the Jews got upset because they knew Jesus was referring 
to the fact that God called himself the I am and they knew he was claiming himself to be God and they were upset about that they thought it was blasphemous they weren't willing to recognize him as the Messiah but he was actually saying I am God If you go to Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 it talks about Jesus as well. He is the image of the invisible God. So nobody had ever seen God. Nobody could understand what he was really like because God is spirit and man can't understand or see that or even know how to describe it and so Jesus said I will take the opportunity to become like man so that you will know what God is like and scripture says he is the image of the invisible God what we see in Jesus is what God is like that we might know and understand him if you go down to the next verse it says for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers all things were created through him and for him and he is before all things and him in him all things consist not only did Jesus create this world as God but without him if he doesn't exist the universe will fall apart because it says he Jesus is the one who makes it consist and stay together so God is God the Father and Jesus now that takes us to a place where we say okay what about the third person who's that and that's the Holy Spirit remember the story in Acts where uh, the two people wanted to sell their land and they decided that they weren't going to use the full price they only said they only got so much and that they didn't give the whole price over to the church to be able to use and what did Peter say to them and you have also lied to God so in that verse he brings the two together you have not only lied to the Holy Spirit you have lied to God so there's one reference that shows the Holy Spirit as being God I want you to note this in baptism in Jesus baptism what was there the voice of the Father the Son himself who was being baptized and it says the Holy Spirit in the form of the dove all three were present at Jesus birth I ah, have sorry baptism at Jesus baptism okay in salvation in first Peter 1 2 it says we are chosen by the Father sanctified by the Spirit and cleansed by the blood of Jesus all three are involved in the act of salvation in sanctification in 2nd Corinthians 13 14 it says may the grace of Jesus the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now one of the things my friend said to me was at the beginning of all of Paul's letters he never mentions the Holy Spirit he only says may 
the grace of God and the peace of Jesus Christ be with you. He never mentions the Holy Spirit. But in all of these verses that I'm giving you, the Holy Spirit is always part of it. And they're all involved in the same process that's taking place as God. When Jesus gave his last command when he left the world, he said, Go ye therefore into all the world, baptizing them in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You can't leave one out. All three are to be included in that. All three are to be included in that. And that's Matthew 28, 19. And then one other verse in Ephesians 3, 14 to 21, it says, that you might be strengthened by the Spirit, that you may know the love of the Father, love of Christ, sorry, and may be filled with the fullness of God. I don't need to go to tradition or I don't need to go to history or read books about what happened in, and just because other nations had multiple gods and the head of those gods was always in the form of three I think they took them from God see what I believe is that in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth Satan started right away to destroy it what did he do? He went to Adam and Eve and convinced them to take and to do wrong. That's Satan's purpose through all of time. For us to do something opposing to God that would draw us away from him and draw other people away from him. And so they take historically, do you know the name Nimrod? You ever heard of that name? Okay. He was one of the, the multi, great, 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 whatever, grandchildren of Noah's children. Okay. And they say that historically Nimrod is around at the time of the Tower of Babel. Well, what happened at the Tower of Babel? They wanted to build a temple that would reach heaven, a tower, temple, whatever, it's the same thing to reach heaven and they said that Nimrod is the one that was the really the one that was involved in this and he was the one that wanted to go against God and in that historically they say that Nimrod chose to make himself like a god and his mother Semiramis was the second part and then his son was the third part of the Trinity and they were supposed to, they led their own people and their nations and stuff and people were supposed to come and follow them and worship them. Well, I believe that's Satan trying to destroy the Trinity of God and his goodness. And all of these different religions that have a top of three people, Satan is using that to take away from what we believe is the truth about a holy God, that he is three in one, but he is God. We need to be able to stand strong on the things that we believe. I was weak. I didn't know all of these things that I researched and found. But I believe we need to know them so that when people come and try to convince us otherwise, we are able to stand up and say, no, that's not right. I believe the Bible, and this is what the Bible says about our God and who he is. There's one last verse that has all three of them in it. Well, it's probably not the last one, but it's the last one I'm going to share with you. And that's 2 Thessalonians 2.13. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 
But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God, from the beginning, chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth to which he called you by our gospel for obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Chosen by God, sanctified by the Spirit, belief in the truth through Jesus. All three parts of God. Now, you know what, I, d I don't think there's ever going to be a way that we're fully going to be able to understand how the actuality of it works. Bring up all kinds of things, whether you use the egg or the water or whatever to try to explain, it doesn't do the trick. I don't think there's ever our fallible minds are going to be able to fully describe to anybody the intricacies of God and there comes a place in our life where we have to be able to say by faith I believe by faith I believe and that's where I come to I believe by faith that God is three in one don't know how it works. Don't know if there's positions of authority or not within that trinity. Have no idea how it's going to be realized in the final days when we see him. Don't have any understanding of that. But I do know. Scripture says God is three in one. I want you to know that. I want you to understand it. I want you to be able to hang on to that and know that God is who he said he is. He is one, a unified one. And that you can trust him. And that you can believe him. And that you can rely on everything about scripture that says he is God. That Jesus is God. He's not just human. No human could ever fulfill the ability to live righteously and perfectly and be able to carry our sins. No human being is possible of that. He, excuse me, he had to be both God and man in order to be able to be perfect. He couldn't do it otherwise. We can't do it by ourselves. We can't. We know that. We all have our faults and our sins and our mistakes and everything that we do, right? We're not perfect. God and God alone is perfect. So don't let anybody try to convince you otherwise. I need to meet with my friend again and talk with him. <laughs> and be able to say, but wait a minute, do you know about this? And do you believe Scripture to be Scripture or do you believe that mankind can change Scripture and alter it? You can't. God's Word says not even a jot or a tittle will be removed. The smallest little thing of Scripture will never change until the world ends. Never will. So be strong, folks. I struggled with this for a long time this week. I was going to do Thessalonians again, and, and then this happened with my friend, and I couldn't go to Thessalonians. <laughs> it just wouldn't let me. And I, uh, yeah, I got a whole sermon out of it and stuff, but no, it, didn't, it wasn't right to be able to do that, so I had to do this for you. I want you to know the truth of Scripture. That's far more important far more important the truth of scripture and who God is if you don't have that foundation in who God is your foundation is faltering 
You need to understand who he is. Let's pray. Father, thank you for what you've been teaching me this week. Not just in searching through scripture, but even coming to a stronger place of knowing that I believe in the word of God. It's not what man says. It's not what historical books say. It's not about all of these new things that come up as we get closer and closer to your return. We know that Satan's going to do everything he can to tear us apart from believing in you and who you are and to walk away and turn our backs on you. But God, no, we will not. We will believe in you, who you are. We will believe what your word says about you. We trust you explicitly. And we ask, Father, that you would strengthen us. Help us to be strong and, and to know enough to be able to say, no, that's not right. I believe this about God and this is what it says. You will not convince me otherwise. May your Holy Spirit minister about us. He's the one that you sent to us to give us, to teach us, instruct us, guide us, to remind us of your words. All of those things. May he do that, Father. May we be willing to listen to as he teaches and instructs us. God, may you be honored and glorified through our lives. I ask this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. <laughs>